chapter 15. The sixth planet was ten times larger than the last one. It was inhabited by an old gentleman who wrote vol voluminous books. Oh, look! Here is an explorer, he acclaimed to himself when he saw the little prince coming. The little prince sat down on the table and panted a little. He had already traveled so much and so far. Where do you come from? The old gentleman said to him. What is that big book, said the little prince. What are you doing? I am a geographer, said the old gentleman. What's a geographer? asked the little prince. A geographer is a scholar who knows the location of all the seas, rivers, towns, mountains, and deserts. Oh, that's very interesting, said the little prince. Here at last is a man who has a real profession. And he cast a look around him at the planet of the geographer. It was the most magnificent and stately planet that he had ever seen. Your planet is very beautiful, he said. Has it any oceans? I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell you, said the geographer. Ah, the little prince was disappointed. Has it any mountains? I couldn't tell you, said the geographer. And towns and rivers and deserts. And deserts. <laughs> and deserts and towns and rivers and deserts I couldn't tell you that either but you are a geographer exactly the geographer said but I am not an explorer I haven't a single explorer on my planet it is not the geographer who goes out to count the towns the rivers the mountains the seas the oceans and the deserts the geographer is much too important to go loafing about he does not leave his desk but he receives the explorers in his study he asks them questions, and he notes down what they recall of their travels. And if the recollections of any one of them seem interesting to him, the geographer orders an inquiry into that explorer's moral character. Well, why is that? Because an explorer who told lies would bring disaster on the books of the geographer. So would an explorer who drank too much? Well, why is that? asked the little prince. Because intoxicated men seek double. Then the geographer would note down two mountains in a place where there was only one. I know someone, said the little prince, who would make a bad explorer. That's possible. Then when the moral character of the explorer is shown to be good, an inquiry is ordered into his discovery. One goes to see it? No. That would be too complicated. But one requires the explorer to furnish proofs. For example, if the discovery in question is that of a large mountain, one requires that large stones be brought back from it. Geographer was suddenly stirred to excitement. But you, you have come from far away. You are an explorer. You shall describe your planet to me. And then, having opened his big register, the geographer sharpened his pencil. The recitals of our explorers are put down first in pencil. One waits until the explorer has furnished proofs before putting them down in ink. Well, said the geographer expectantly. Oh, where I live, said the little prince, it is not very interesting. It is all so small. I've got three volcanoes, two volcanoes are active, and the other is extinct, but one never knows. One never knows, said the geographer. I also have a flower. Oh, we do not record flowers, said the geographer. Well, why is that? The flower is the most beautiful thing on my planet. We do not record them, said the geographer, because they are ephemeral. What does that mean, ephemeral? Geographer, said the geographer. Geography, said the geographer, are the books which, of all books, are most concerned with matters of consequence. They never become old-fashioned. It is very rare that a mountain changes its position. It is very rarely that an ocean empties itself of its waters. We write of eternal things, but extinct volcanoes may come to life again. The little prince interrupted. But what does that mean? Ephemeral. Ephemeral. Whether volcanoes are extinct or alive, it comes to the same thing for us, said the geographer. The thing that matters to us is the mountain. It does not change. Now what does that mean? Ephemeral, repeated the little prince, who never in his life let go of a question once he had asked it. It seems which is in danger of speedy disappearance. It means... <laughs> ephemeral means which is in danger of speedy disappearance. So ephemeral and speedy disappearance, and it's going to be extinct. Is my flower in danger of speedy disappearance? Certainly it is. My flower is ephemeral, the little prince said to himself. And she has only four thorns to defend herself against the world, and I have left her on my planet all alone? This was the first moment of regret, but he took courage once more. 
What place would you advise me to visit now? He asked. The planet Earth, replied the geographer. It has a good reputation. And the little prince went away, thinking of his flower. Chapter 16. So then the seventh planet was the Earth. The Earth was not just an ordinary planet. One can count there 111 kings, not forgetting, to be sure, the Negro kings among them. 7,000 geographers, 900,000 businessmen, 7.5 million tipplers, 311 million conceited men. That is to say, about 2 billion grown-ups. To give you an idea of the size of Earth, I will tell you that before the invention of electricity, it was necessary to maintain over the whole of the six, six continents a veritable army of 462, 511 lamplighters for the street lamps. Seen from a slight distance, that would make a splendid spectacle. The movements of this army would be regulated like those of the ballet and the opera. First would come the turn of the lamplighters in New Zealand and Australia. Having set their lamps alight, these would go off to sleep. Next, the lamplighters lamp of China and Siberia would enter for their steps in the, dis in the dance, and they too would be waved back into the wings. After that would come the turn of the lamplighters of Russia and the Indies then those of Africa and Europe, and then those of South America, and then those of North America. And never would they make a mistake in the order of their entry upon the stage, and it would be magnificent. Only the man who is in charge of the single lamp at the North Pole and his colleague who is responsible for the single lamp at the South Pole, only these two would live free from toil and care. They would be busy twice a year. Chapter 17. When one wishes to play the wit, he sometimes wonders a little from the truth. I have not been altogether honest in what I have told you about the lamplighters, and I realize that I run the risk of giving a false idea of our planet to those who do not know it. Men occupy a very small space upon the earth, and if two billion inhabitants who people at surface were to all stand upright and somewhat crowded together, as they do for some big public assembly, they could easily be put into one public square 20 miles long and 20 miles wide. All of humanity could be piled up on a small Pacific islet. The grown-ups, to be sure, would not believe you when you tell them that. They imagine that they will fill a great deal of space. You, they fancy themselves as important as the baobabs. You should advise them, then, to make their own calculations. They adore figures, and that will please them. The little prince says, when the little prince arrived on the earth, he was very surprised not to see any people. So, but do not waste your time on this extra task. It is unnecessary. You have, I know, confidence in me. When the little prince arrived on the earth, he was very much surprised not to see any people. He was beginning to be afraid he had come to the wrong planet. And when a coil of gold, the color of the moonlight, flashed across the sand. Good morning, the little prince said the little prince uh, courteously. Good evening, said the snake. What planet is this on which I have come down? asked the little prince. This is Earth. This is Africa, the snake answered. Ah, then there are no people on the earth. This is the desert. There are no people in the desert. The earth is large, said the snake. The little prince sat down on a stone and raised his eyes toward the sky. I wonder, he said, whether the stars are set alight in heaven so that one day each one of us may find his own again. Look at my planet. It is right there above us. But how far away it is. It is beautiful, the snake said. What has brought you here? I've been having some trouble with the flower, said the little prince. Ah, said the snake, and they were both silent. Where are the men? The little prince at last took up the conversation again. It is a little lonely in the desert. It is also lonely among men, the snake said. The little prince gazed at him for a long time. You're a funny animal, he said at last. You're no thicker than my finger, but I'm more powerful than the finger of a king, said the snake. The little prince smiled. You're not very powerful. You haven't even any feet. You cannot even travel. I can carry you farther than any ship. 
could take you, said the snake. He twined himself around the little prince's ankle like a golden bracelet. Whomever I touch, I send back to the earth from whence he came. The snake spoke again. But you are innocent and true, and you come from a star. The little prince made no reply. You move me to pity. You are so weak on this planet made of granite, the snake said. I can help you someday if you grow too homesick for your own planet. I can... Oh, I understand you very well, said the little prince. But why do you always speak in riddles? I solved them all, said the prince, and they were both silent. Chapter 18. The little prince crossed the desert and met only one flower. It was a flower with three petals, a flower of no account at all. Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the flower. Where are the men? The little prince asked politely. The flower had once seen a caravan passing. Men, she echoed. I think there are six or seven of them in existence. I saw them several years ago. But one never knows where to find them. The wind blows them away. They have no roots, and that makes their life very difficult. Goodbye, said the little prince. Goodbye, said the flower. And after that, the little prince climbed a high mountain. The only mountains he ever, had ever known were the three volcanoes, which came up to his knees. And he used the extinct volcano as a footstool. From a mountain as high as this one, he said to himself, I shall be able to see the whole planet at one glance. And all the people. But he saw nothing, save peaks of rock that were sharpened like needles. Good morning, he said courteously. Good morning, good morning, good morning, answered the echo. Who are you? said the little prince. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Be my friends. I'm all alone. I'm all alone. All alone. All alone, answered the echo. What a queer planet, he thought. It is altogether dry and altogether pointed and altogether harsh and forbidding. And the people have no imagination. They repeat whatever one says to them. On my planet, I had a flower. She was always the first to speak. But it happened that after walking for a long time through sand and rocks and snow, the little prince at last came upon a road, and all roads lead to the abodes of men. Good morning, he said. He was standing before a garden, all abloom with roses. Good morning, said the roses. The little prince gazed at them. They all look like his flower. Who are you, he demanded, thunderstruck. We are roses, the roses said, and he was overcome with sadness. His flower had told him that she was the only one of her kind in all the universe, and here were five thousand of them, all alike in a single garden. She would, she would be very much annoyed, he said to himself, if she should see that. She would cough most dreadfully, and she would pretend that she was dying to avoid being laughed at. And I should be obliged to pretend that I was nursing her back to life, for if I did not do that, to humble myself also, she would really allow herself to die. And then he went on with his reflections. I thought that I was rich, with a flower that was unique in all the world, and I had, and all I had was a common rose, a common rose and three volcanoes that came come up to my knees, and one of them, perhaps extinct forever. That doesn't make me a very great prince. And he laid down in the grass, and he cried. It was then that the fox appeared. Chapter 21. Good morning, said the fox. Good morning, the little prince responded. Politely, although he turned around, he saw nothing. I'm right here, the voice said, under the apple tree. Where are you, asked the little prince, and added, you're very pretty to look at. I am a fox, the fox said. Come and play with me, proposed the little prince. I am so unhappy. 